Misperception and War. Here you can see Indian soldiers deployed in the Himalayas opposite China. So the basis for misperceptions is the cognitive schema and cognitive dissonance. Both the reliance on oversimplified models of reality that may not be appropriate and the resistance to new concepts that may cause a contradiction within that schema and is therefore emotionally uh, uncomfortable. I'm going to apply misperception hypotheses to Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, as he behaved prior and the lead up to the 1962 Sino-Indian War. There's a fair bit of published information about him, whereas there's far less information available on his adversary, Mao Zedong, the Chinese leader. The 1962 Sino-Indian War was a watershed in many ways. It defined the relationship between the two most populous countries in the world and current nuclear powers. This makes it in some sense an easy case. In effect, we expect misperceptions to occur here. So it's not a very, very powerful test case, but it's a useful case for illustrating the effects of misperception. So a bit of background history. In 1949, the Chinese Communist Revolution is complete, and the traditional territory of China is consolidated through military force by Beijing. On October 7th, 1950, 30,000 soldiers of the Chinese People's Liberation Army invade Tibet one column of which moves through the Indian-claimed Aksai Chin along a trunk road. The Chinese quickly realized that to control Tibet, a province of theirs, without a railway and, without, and with very poor roads, they would need land then claimed by India. So you can see here a map produced in 1954 laying out China's claims for both territory and uh, the, as a beneficiary of tribute from its neighbors. This is from uh, Liu Pei Han uh, in his short history of China. This here is a more visually appealing representation of that. And let me just show you. So this region here is the Xi Chin, and this is the road that passes through the Xi Chin, and that's territory claimed by India which the Chinese soldiers used to arrive at Lhasa, which is the capital. So subsequently, the People's Republic of China accused India of being hostile, to which India submitted by relinquishing its rights to Tibet, rights they had inherited from the British Empire. The Indian government tried to appease China by opposing the discussion of Tibet's appeal to the UN General Assembly of November 23, 1950. Thus, the policy in India was to cultivate Chinese friendship and buy it off. On 29th April 1954, India and China signed an agreement, otherwise known as the Pan Shiel, or the Five Principles. The main points of these were, one, mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, two, mutual non-aggression, three, mutual non-interference in each other's internal affairs, four, equal and mutual benefit working relationship, and five, peaceful coexistence. The crisis that led up to the 1962 war was the 1958 Kampa Rebellion. Tibetan tribesmen trained by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency in the Colorado Hills of the U.S. led a general insurgency. Indian intelligence, without the full knowledge of the Indian government, assisted the U.S. China reacted with protests to India. This then led to a series of disputes. The Kenzaman incident occurred on August 7, 1959. About 200 Chinese troops intruded into the Indian border in Kenzamane in the Kamang Frontier Division at east of Thagla Ridge. Which, when challenged by the Indian patrol and asked to withdraw, the Chinese soldiers pushed the Indian party consisting of 10 soldiers to the bridge at Drangkung Samba. Then there was the Longju incident. On August 25, 1959, around 300 Chinese soldiers crossed into the Longju region of the Subashan Frontier Division and opened fire at the Indian post there. The post was completely surrounded and the Indian soldiers apprehended but were later released. On October 21, 1959, at the Konka Pass incident, nine Indian soldiers were killed. On November 2, 1961, a meeting was held at Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's house, the Indian Prime Minister, and he was a 
uh, a pandit, meaning a Kashmir, uh, a member of a Kashmir Hindu minority. And this meeting was attended by, among others, Krishna Menon, the defense minister, Lieutenant General Thapar, the chief of the army staff, Lieutenant General Kahl, the quartermaster general, Brigadier Palit, and O. Pularetti, the defense secretary. It was decided that a India would adopt a forward policy. In Ladakh, which is the Tibetan part of Kashmir, the Indian army would patrol as far forward as possible from the present Indian positions towards the international border. Posts would be established on the border of Indian territory in an attempt to prevent further Chinese incursions. B. The same would also apply to areas in Uttar Pradesh on the Indochina border, where posts would be established as far possible uh, towards the Indian Territory. Now Nehru believed that by placing a limited military force on the border he would be signaling his intention to resolve the dispute peacefully with China. Chinese reaction to the forward posts was quite different. In June of 1962 Mo came, Mao came out of seclusion. He had gone into seclusion because of the political damage he suffered as a result of the Great Leap Forward fiasco in which about 30 million Chinese farmers starved to death. So Mao decided to deal aggressively with India. If Foreign Minister Zhou Enlai, who's shown here, was in charge, it is likely that India would um, uh, not have been attacked. On July 22nd to August 3rd, 1962, in Geneva, Chinese Marshal Chen Yi resisted V.K. Krishna Menon's insistence on withdrawing Chinese forces from Ladakh. Major Chinese buildup occurred and began on August 29th under Zhou Enlai. China's goal was not to strike first but to provoke India into making the first move. In October, Mao, Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping were convinced by their military staff to conduct an aggressive first assault. On October 14th, Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, gave his approval. But of course, uh, this was in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so he was otherwise distracted in the confrontation with the United States. Mao approved the attack on October 18, 1962. Chinese forces attacked two days later, on October 20, 1962, and on October 22nd, the CIA detected missiles in Cuba. And this is one of the reasons why this war is not that present in the Western consciousness, because most Westerners were focused on the Cuban Missile Crisis. So here we have a map of South Asia and the three regions are the areas where China attacked aggressively, of which the most important for China was the Aksai Chin, which is the area that's the farthest north and the farthest uh, to the left. This here is the northeast frontier area, which is on the extreme eastern side of India, and it's on the Tibetan border. This is the Wulong Front, which is the central area where China attacked. And it's uh, sort of nestled in between Bhutan and Nepal. This is the Aksai Chin, which is the plateau in Tibet where Chinese soldiers pass through along on the Green Road. The red arrows indicate where the Chinese attacked. And the squared area, Chushul, is where the Indians resisted the Chinese attack. And here you can see Indian soldiers in the Aksai Chin. The 1962 war lasted from October 20th to November 21st and consisted of three brief attacks over October, a delay for a logistical buildup, and then another three attacks in November. The attack took, took place in the Aksai Chin, the Wolong Front, and the Nefa se sector. Indian forces resisted the initial attacks in October. In November, during the second set of attacks, the pressure grew too great and Indian forces began to withdraw, which then turned into a disorganized retreat. Chinese forces took a lot of prisoners and advanced into the Ganges Valley. In the Aksai Chin, the Chinese came up against organized Indian resistance at Chishul. In their only failed attack, they left about 500 dead on the field. On November 20th, China announced a unilateral ceasefire and withdrew from the Nefa and the Wulong Front. Indian losses were 1,423 killed and many wounded prisoners and missing. PLA losses were probably less. 
The PLA loss, the PLA claimed about 4,800 Indians killed and 3,900 captured in their uh, 2007 publication listed in your, uh, in your notes. So Robert Jervis developed a theory of misperceptions. And what we're going to do here is apply the misperceptions to this case. Misperceptions are systematic misinterpretations of information. It's not simply a high rate of errors in decision making, but errors with a directional bias. Right? Otherwise, the positive and the negative errors would cancel each other out, like when you're trying to guess how many jelly beans there are in a jar. This behavior is irrational to the extent that people would term it so if they had complete information. So what were Nehru's world view? When Mahatma Gandhi died shortly after Indian independence, the leadership in New Delhi was inherited by Nehru and Sardar Patel. Whereas Nehru was a Fabian socialist, an intellectual, an anti-imperialist, and had widespread support among the masses, Patel had the support of the wealthy, the bureaucracy, and the military. Patel had repeatedly warned Nehru of the danger posed by China to India. His premature death left Nehru in charge. Nehru held an idealized image of China. He made much of the alleged Chinese-Indian cultural affinity and the common colonial experience. He supposed the two people were bound by a common religion, Buddhism. In 1944, he wrote of the commerce of scholars during the Buddhist period. Typically also of Asian intellectuals, he sought to identify in a common colonial experience. And here's a quote from him. Quote, after being cut off from each other for many centuries, India and China were brought by some strange fate under the influence of the British East India Company. India had to endure this for long. But, but in China, the contact was brief. But even so, it brought opium and war. Close quotes. Nehru was intrigued by the awesome spectacle of China on the move. His admiration for this phenomenon, phenomenon made it difficult for him to see the immediate threat to India. Nehru said before the Lok Sabha, the Indian parliament, quote, now we must realize that this revolution that came to China is the biggest thing that has taken place in the world at present. In a period of only a few years, a country the size of China has moved and arisen from slumber, and for the first time in several hundred years of history, China now has a strong central government." Close quote. Nehru's foreign policy was designed to ensure world peace and thereby permit India to develop economically without interference or involvement in war. Nehru believed that India could use the international forces of human morality to win favor for this cause. Nehru therefore wanted to enhance India's international prestige as a force for peace and for prestige's sake itself. The role of international arbitrator for peace also appealed to Nehru's ego. Nehru sought the Panchil, the five principles with China, both to appease China, but also as an example of the cooperation for the rest of the world. He also chose to suppress Chinese violations of that agreement so that India's participation in the Geneva negotiations over the fate of Indochina would not be jeopardized. This also implied an emotional rejection of the Western world, which had so long been associated with colonialism and instead an attraction for the utopian world of Fabian socialism, which made it difficult for Nehru to view the communist world objectively. Nehru was very critical of French and U.S. support for the war in Indochina. His hostility to U.S. increased when the U.S. armed Pakistan in the 50s and 60s. To these ends, India had refrained from criticizing China over the occupation of Tibet, China's involvement in the Korean War, and China's clashes with Taiwan. Nehru was familiar with, but openly rejected, the logic of power and realism. He, he, the idea that states use power and threats of force to increase that power. He did not believe that India had to align with either the West or the East Bloc for security, and that neutrality would provide protection. If India rejects alliances with the West and the East, it will not thereby be seen as a threat by either. He feared the effects of the security dilemma, that preparations for defense by one state may provoke a spiral of hostility with another. Gandhi had warned Nehru of the security dilemma with Pakistan during the opening phases of the first Kashmir war. Nehru believed that moral suasion had an equivalent power and could be harnessed through international institutions. So let's now apply the misperception hypotheses. 
Hypothesis one, decision makers tend to fit incoming information into their existing theories. Nehru's experience is of the struggle for Indian independence alongside Mahatma Gandhi against British imperial rule. Lessons learned from that episode were that persistence and open communications were a universal solution. In 1961, Nehru's forward policy in Ladakh was in full swing. He believed that it provided a clear signal to China that India would be firm but not hostile. Nehru did not believe that China would launch a major attack in retaliation. China's appeasement policy with India, however, was willfully deceitful. China's improvement of relations with India was the result of a broadly coordinated communist shift in strategy. A treatise by Stalin entitled Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR, published in October of 1952, just before the 19th Communist Party Congress was convened, launched the new policy. It stressed economic cooperation among communist states and economic competition against Western capitalism, instead of pursuing unrestrained violence. Stalin called for competitive coexistence and argued that countries with differing social systems and ways of life can coexist peacefully. The change of policy had come as an adjustment to the reality of nuclear arsenals. A policy of unrestrained military confrontation with the US would have led to defeat of Moscow. And China was to agree with this policy until the late 1950s. Indicators included the drastic diversion of Himalayan trade away from India and towards China. Nehru also played down and suppressed publicly the fact that only weeks after the signing of the Panchil with China in 1954, Chinese troops entered into Indian claimed Himalaya. In 1955, the year of the Bandung Non-Aligned Conference in Indonesia, the Chinese twice violated Indian territory at Barahati and Damzan. Nehru received confirmation of a Chinese road being built in the Aksai Chin in October of 1958. In August of 1959, Chinese soldiers attacked an Indian police detachment, killing one and capturing the remainder, and then pushed two miles deeper into India to attack another police post. Although Nehru publicly admitted for the first time that China violated Indian territory, he described it to Parliament as a petty intrusion. In October 1959, nine Indian border police were ambushed and killed by Chinese soldiers. In response to criticism in Parliament, Nehru said, quote, Talk of leaving non-alignment is utterly wrong and useless." Close quote. Nehru rationalized these as the result of a temporarily and periodically delinquent nation and not genuinely hostile communist state of China. Until October 1962, Nehru believed that China would eventually withdraw and negotiate on terms acceptable to India. Even at the moment of attack on October 22, 1962, Nehru admitted, quote, The time has come for us to realize fully this menace that threatens the freedom of our people and the independence of our country, close quote. But he added, quote, India would not abandon non-alignment, close quote. On October 29th, desperately suffering from the attack by China, Nehru asked for help from the U.S. and England they and Canada immediately sent unconditional military aid. This is a humiliation for Nehru. Nehru also looked for moral support from the non-aligned movement without success. Tito of Yugoslavia remained silent. Ghana's Nkrumah protested British help to India. Sukarno of Indonesia supported communist China and Egypt's Nasser offered no more than a mediator's role. Hypothesis 1A. A theory will have a greater impact the greater the ambiguity of the information. Soviet signals for India to negotiate with China were interpreted as ambiguous indications that Moscow would pressure China from attacking. Chinese border incidents were precisely too violent to, to be rational for China to be deliberately organizing them, so Nehru chose to assume that they were navigation accidents, the behavior of isolated frontier groups, or merely, merely military probes by an uncommitted and insecure new state. As India had achieved independence two years before the Chinese Civil War was resolved, it was not until a week after the attack on October 20th that Nehru correctly diagnosed the true situation. Hypothesis 1b. A theory will have a greater impact the greater the theory is held in confidence by the decision maker. 
Nehru's domestic philosophy of inclusiveness and state socialism bred in him a greater tolerance for differences among people. Nehru had little experience of international power politics and a great deal of experiences engaged in moral and legalistic resistance with British authorities. He was also a witness to the success of Mahatma Gandhi and his civil disobedience protests. Nehru did not participate in the Indian National Argue, Army organized by Bose which sought with Japanese help to free India from British control by force. Hypothesis 2. Decision makers tend to prefer their current theories and are unwilling to alter them. Nehru tended to react very coolly to the American representative, particularly John Foster Dulles, who tried to press upon Nehru the threat posed by communist allies of the Soviet Union. Repeated attempts were made to convince Nehru that a Soviet attack was likely through Central Asia. Hypothesis 3. New information is better assimilated if it arrives to the attention of the decision maker in bulk at one time. India's diplomatic and intelligence community, who were tightly controlled by Nehru, did not make much effort to deduce China's likely course of action. It was not until a week into the Chinese attack that China's intentions were clear to Nehru. Hypothesis 4. Misperception is worst when there is a missing concept, and least when there is an unfilled concept. Nehru could not conceive of the fact that China, a fellow developing state whose primary goal was economic development, would attack India. Nehru had no concept of an aggressive and predatorial former colonized state. Nehru also had no concept of the importance of deterrence, of using force to threaten punishment in order to preserve security. Nehru did have an unfilled concept, that of the benefits of alliance. It took Nehru little time to adapt and request such aid from the US. Hypothesis 5. Misunderstanding is likely if the two decision-making actors have different backgrounds. Nehru believed that negotiations and powerful solutions resolved disputes between states. This was based largely on his experience of the Indian independence movement. Mao and the Chinese communists had a much harsher experience. Fighting for the communist revolution was violent, costly, long, and required disciplined control from a doctrine of popular struggle. The long march in 1935 had killed a great many of the revolutionaries, as did the subsequent conflicts with the Japanese and the nationalists. Mao believed that Nehru's India was a capitalist ally of the West, particularly given his zero-sum understanding of the world is divided between the East and the West bloc. Hypothesis 6. When people spend time on a plan, they believe their message will be clear. Nehru's foreign policy consistently revolved around non-alignment. India would help organize a third coalition rejecting both the communist and the Western influence. However, Nehru did not realize that for China, India was significantly less relevant than the threat from the US. The occupation of Japan, obtaining nuclear secrets from the Soviet Union, and the existence of Taiwan. Beijing did not give enough notice to interpret Indian actions and statements. Hypothesis 7. Decision makers do not realize that their message does not work because actions and their signals often don't work out as intended. Nehru's public statements were inconsistent with his political and military actions. In 1961, Nehru ordered the Indian army to invade and secure the former colony, the Portuguese Goa. Nehru viewed it as an act of anti-imperialism. However, globally it was viewed as territorial aggrandizement. On October 11, 1962, faced with Lieutenant General B. N. Call's alarming report, Nehru decided neither to build up Indian strength in order to attack Chinese positions, nor to retreat. The next day, he said at the airport en route to Sri Lanka, quote, our instructions are to free our territory, close quote. China's interpretation of India was that of a paper tiger. Basically, a major public behavior that they're a threat uh, uh, basically threatening uh, China's influence over Tibet, but without the military force to back up their territorial claims. Be Beijing's military leaders believe that had India wanted to invade Tibet, and there was little China could do to stop them because of the limited number of Chinese troops deployed in Tibet, and that the undeveloped infrastructure that linked 
uh, China to Tibet would have made uh, an Indian victory almost certain. Hypothesis 8. Decision makers see other states as more hostile than them. Beijing repeatedly filed protests in 1958 over India's support of the Tibetan insurgents. Nehru did not share the Chinese concern over the 1958 Kampa Rebellion in Tibet and India's role in giving support for it by providing sanctuary to the Dalai Lama in 1959, who's depicted here in the center photograph. Nehru did not see that its support to the rebellion endangered China's control over not only Tibet, but Xinjiang and other Western Chinese states populated principally by separatist-minded minorities. Hypothesis 8a. Decision makers also believe that their choices are caused by circumstances and that therefore they are compelled, whereas the choice of their adversaries are planned and according to choice. This is the fundamental attribution error we spoke in the previous lecture about. Nehru certainly believed that the choices he made for India's foreign policy were compelled by India's need for economic development. More specifically, his forward policy was simply reacting to China's transgressions. However, the second part of the hypothesis is falsified. Nehru believed that the incidents in the Himalayas were not part of any long-term plan from Beijing and that while the Chinese were not compelled to cause them, they were an understandable byproduct of the nature of the confusing geography of the Himalayan frontier. Hypothesis 9. Decision makers tend to see the behavior of others as more organized than is actually the case. Nehru did exaggerate the extent to which China and the Soviet Union linked their policies and thereby was in error when he assumed that the Soviets were in a position to restrain Beijing. However, this hypothesis seems to be falsified by the evidence. Nehru actually saw the Chinese as significantly less organized than they actually were, especially in terms of the communist policy of peaceful coexistence then adopted by both Beijing and Moscow to deceive the West. Hypothesis 10. Decision makers take the position of their adversary's foreign office as the position of the other state. Nehru took the public statements emanating from Beijing more seriously than the evidence of Chinese preparations for war in Tibet. Nehru spent unnecessary amounts of effort seeking terms for negotiations rather than preparing India for war. Hypothesis 11. Decision makers tend to exaggerate their adversary's action. When the adversary complies, they deduce that it is because of a submissive response to the decision maker's own actions or threats. When the adversary resists, the decision maker deduces that it's because of domestic factors. Initially, after the implementation of the forward policy in 1961, Nehru had interpreted the inaction of China as confirming his belief that he had successfully transmitted a firm but controlled message that Chinese aggression would be resisted. Nehru erroneously assumed that China attacked because it had misinterpreted China's peaceful overtures, that there was domestic political turmoil in China affecting decision making, perhaps the consequence of the terribly mismanaged Great Leap Forward that starved 30 million Chinese farmers. Hypothesis 12. Decision makers assume that if they do not conceal their intentions, then their actions will be correctly perceived by their adversary. Nehru made repeated public statements that India did not want a confrontation with China. The Chinese were less concerned with Nehru's public statements than the apparent threat India posed to Tibet by Nehru's actions. Indian occupation of the Aksai Chin would cut Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, off from China. Hypothesis 13. If the decision makers do not believe that others see them as a menace, then they are not likely to see their differences in interests. Nehru believed that India and China had a common purpose in resisting imperialism. China's experience with imperialism was quite different. Unlike India, it had resisted occupation successfully and was more disposed to preparing itself to restore its previous level of power and prestige. The Chinese Communist Party was also more concerned with advancing their communist ideology and India was a target as it was clearly not a communist country. Hypothesis 14. 
The evidence for a decision maker's own theory also tends to fit the alternative theory. Nehru's belief that Chinese cooperation with India was evidence of a common goal between two former colonial states and middle powers seemed to be reflected by the evidence. China acquiesced to India's role as a mediator in the Korean and the Indochina wars. However, it was equally likely that China encouraged India's cooperation to distract it from interfering with core Chinese goals. This is consistent with a power politics interpretation of reality. So what are some of the criticisms of misperception theory? Well, obvious problems with these mis misperceptions is that they're very difficult to measure. When does what a leader say indicate what is believed versus what is a lie? And number two, how important are misperceptions? When are they more likely to occur and have an effect on decision making? Now we can conceive of safeguards against misperceptions. One, be aware that you're not making unbiased assessments. Nehru rarely seemed to question himself. He was very arrogant and secretive. Number two, make your ideas logically linked. Nehru's logic was clear, but he was understandably engaged in wishful thinking about China's behavior, and this was compounded by a great deal of uncertainty. Make your propositions explicit. Separate your identity from the assessment. Don't allow what you want to bias your analysis. Number five, encourage devil's advocacy. Look at material from different angles. With the death of Sardar Patel, this was difficult for Nehru. India's policy shifted to the left. Now there's a problem. All of these recommendations have time costs. They divert resources. They increase dissension. Particularly in the event of a crisis or a dispute, the decision maker may not have the luxury of the time to implement these safeguards. The consequences of the 1962 Sino-Indian War were significant. The shock of the war was largely responsible for Nehru's death three years later. The war led India into a massive military buildup, a closer security relationship with the Soviet Union, an arms race with Pakistan that led directly into the 1965 and 1971 wars, and the initiation of India's and Pakistan and then India's nuclear weapons program. Nehru's daughter, the future Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi never made the mistake of her father by neglecting the importance of power.